Since the beginning of the LBGTQ movement, there has been an increase in the mass incarceration of members of the community. On February 5, 2015, Black and Pink NYC held a discussion panel, Queer and Trans Prison Advocacy 101, in the Prashansky Auditorium at the CUNY Graduate Center. Now, and I, I just don't blame it on the people committing the crimes. I blame some of the parents because hate is something that's taught. It's decades and decades of hate being taught to other decades of hate. And as mentors and as parents, we have the fourth hand in preventing this. A lot of what's going on now is because there are no mentors. There are no people to stand up and say, don't do that. As parents, we've kind of dropped the ball as, as standing members of society. We kind of dropped the ball on being productive, being, there was a time when your child did something, they were reprimanded not only by the parent, but by the neighbors as well. Um, that doesn't go on anymore. If you reprimand someone else's child, you kind of get in trouble by the parent. The parent doesn't want you to reprimand their child. We've kind of stepped away from the age where it's okay to say stop. But it would be a different turn of hand where society's not that forthcoming or, or nice to, to people like us. A common theme was the lack of respect in the prisons for gender preference. In New York State policy, Gender dysphoria is determined as a mental health diagnosis defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. The Department of Corrections should address inmate health care needs after an appropriate diagnosis, which protects privacy and confidentiality. You know, the person on the inside, you know, leading the efforts at their own advocacy but that being said, it's also important to make sure that the decisions that they are making are um, ones with informed consent, specifically. And you know, the correctional officers will lie and lie and lie to them. And you know, as as in Cayenne's case, and as in my case, when before I started doing this, you know, there's this idea that protective custody is what it says it is: protective custody where you know, there are like more correctional officers defending you or something along, or you're in a different cell block or something like that. Um, but really all it is is a sort of glorified solitary confinement. Like because of sort of the prejudice attitudes of our society in general, um, sort of get uh, hyper concentrated, like super, it's like a super prejudice, you know, in, prisons among the guards and the other inmates and um, they're also facing things like getting put into solitary confinement and that's where a person is taken out of what's called general population taken out of where all the other uh, people are and put into a cell by themselves um, and they're in that cell 23 hours out of the day and then it's only for one hour that they're allowed outside in a small cage where they're only allowed to walk around back and forth in this small cage and aren't allowed to talk to other people. Drawing upon the pen pal program, the panelists discussed the importance of advocating for prisoners on the inside. The letters from the pen pal program show that the prisoner is not alone in his or her circumstances. 